Uh, and in fact, there are uh, quite a few different solutions out there. There's, um, uh, it's not a, a space that's been dominated by any one like Hadoop or like Spark. Um, and in fact, we were, have looked at quite a lot of these and even the one that best fits our needs, um, in my estimation, uh, Apache Drill for a number of reasons, it looks like what we want for HEP analysis, even then, it doesn't fit the needs very well. Uh, so, you know, all of these are SQL based. All of them have you, have you write either standard SQL or something like SQL, which is too limiting for a reason I'll explain in the next slide. Uh, most of these are Java, hard to integrate with HEP software. Uh, and so they're, they're really more suited to flat and tuple analyses. So um, what I'll be talking about in this talk are the bits and pieces that we are going, uh, that we're developing uh, to make this kind of thing possible. So we're, uh, uh, we're coming at this not uh, from the point of view of, okay, we're going to design the system and we know what, what, what needs to be designed right now. No, we're developing all the, the, the pieces and finding out, well, is this gonna work? You know, and we're not entirely sure how, we're going, how they're going to be put together yet because we need to uh, um, not, not design ourselves into a corner. So uh, what I'll be talking about here are uh, some of the things that I found to be uh, most relevant for us to think about at an early stage, fast execution on nested non-flat data, where non-flat is the HEP specific part. Uh, distributed processing, uh, that's, that's standard. Uh, and actually the abstract for this talk said a lot about a custom uh, HEP specific query language and in the time since I wrote the abstract, I've been realizing that's a lot less crucial than these other points. So start with fast execution. Um, the SQL-like query engines uh, are optimized for what we call a flat and tuple analysis. Actually, let me, let me say a bit more that they are much more optimized than, than a standard uh, general purpose programming uh, program. Uh, what you write is not what gets executed. What you write is uh, a description of what you want and then it hyper-optimizes that to, to get you uh, what you need the fastest way possible. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of those optimization steps that they take assume that, you're, that you are not doing uh, anything as complex as what we need to do in HEP. Uh, and so these, these query engines are best suited to like a rectangular and strictly rectangular table of numbers that you can slice and fit, a filter and such. So, uh, some late stage HEP analyses can fit this model when you've decided that, oh yes, I'm definitely doing a, a, a muon analysis and oh, I know I don't need more than four muons so I can you know, make table columns for muon one, muon two, muon three, muon four and if there are any more than that, you truncate and if there are any less than that, you fill it with zeros, you know, that thing. Uh, that's what you'd have to do in order to use one of these uh, systems um, uh, fluidly. So in general, general physics analyses, we need arbitrary length lists of objects. Uh, so think of like events containing jets and jets contain tracks and tracks contain hits. We need that kind of uh, structure. So, um, and so we have frameworks for doing this. Um, uh, but these would be, but these are too heavy handed for the low latency queries I was talking about. So just to give an illustration of the orders of magnitude, uh, that are that are possible here. Our current frameworks kilohertz um, for event processing, uh, and they've been designed for that because you know event reconstruction you can take um, you know, can take a second to fit all the tracks or something. Uh, but when you're doing analysis and you want to do a query like just your entire job is fill one histogram with a jet PT. That's your whole hi that's your whole job. That's like a query. Well, uh, if you just write a minimal for loop uh, in memory, of course that's much, much faster than, than using this framework. And you can see why, and you can just pull it apart at each stage, all of the things that our frameworks assume that you're gonna need, and each of those shows where you lose an order of magnitude all the way down, some four orders of magnitude between what would be possible if we just wanted to, as fast as possible, execute the simplest possible thing versus doing that in a framework. So for a query system, we would have to be able to do that simple thing. So um, 
uh, here's, uh, here's an idea, and this comes from uh, analysis of how uh, SQL optimizes code. You know, it takes your code and it rebuilds it into something that's faster. Here's an idea. Say you're going to express your query as a Python uh, for loop, uh, like that one there. For event in uh, root tree, for jet in, in event.jets, fill that histogram. Um, we're going to do something similar to what SQL does in transforming that code into different code that does a, a quite a different thing, but will give you the same result. And in this case, uh, all of the data are in columnar arrays, and the uh, event and jet objects in the, in the first code get translated into event and jet indices into arrays in the second case. So this is a code transformation. And uh, it can be very fast. In fact, uh, it's, it's here that Python code, which is translated into something compiled, uh, is outperforming uh, standard root analysis by some factors. So, uh, so the way to read this plot is each of the groups of bars is a different query that I made as some tests. Uh, and uh, the, the different colors are doing successively smarter things. So first, doing a root analysis without dropping branch branches, then drop branches as you're supposed to with set branch status, uh, and then using a slimmer file so that it's not even iterating over those sub branches, and then using uh, a new interface into um, uh, the, the low-level root objects to look at those, to look at the, uh, the columnar data that it has in memory uh, directly as arrays and do that code transformation and you can get to the green bar which is uh, vectors of several faster than uh, the doing C++ and root. And in fact, if you then, now this difference between these plots and these plots is I took the same green and I increased the scale. If you uh, are caching that data either on disk or in memory, uh, you can get uh, repeat rates even faster. So if you make one plot of JetPT and then another plot with a cut and then another plot with a different cut, you can do that more quickly. So that's what I had to say about, uh, about uh, fast execution, except that you can try this out. Um, so look up the slides afterwards or ask me. Five minutes, okay. So now the, the second topic, uh, distributed processing. Uh, notice the, the tens of megahertz rates that I was quoting on the previous page, those were all single threaded. So now we can take this and also parallelize it. Uh, and this is somewhat more conventional. Um, uh, you could imagine, oh, well, we have batch systems all over the place. You could just use Condor or something. Well, uh, there are a few things that are different from a standard batch job. Um, one is the overhead latency should be small enough for interactive use. So every job is like a command that you run on a, on a terminal. You want a result quickly. Um, the query to plot, if the, if the results of these queries are going to be plots, uh, it has actually two phases, not just you split the data and, and run it in parallel, and then something in the system has to combine them to give you just a plot back. So this involves some MapReduce coordination in the server, which is not unheard of. Um, the input data should, should be cached with column granularity, and that, uh, to get the, the uh, speed of factors I was showing on the plot previously. Uh, and uh, subtasks, if you're going to have cache, subtasks have to be preferentially sent where the cache is, or otherwise you won't be able to make much use of that. Uh, and then we also have this, this issue in, in HEP where some data sets are much more popular than others, and so you want to be able to scale that. So we had, um, so all of this implies that you need some distributed mutable state, which is a hard thing. and uh, we've been studying, uh, find where can we find this done for us, and we find that a lot of the, uh, the bits and pieces that we want uh, are publicly available uh, tools. So for instance, uh, uh, Apache Drill is based uh, entirely on Zookeeper. Um, and so that is a, a, a piece in common that we can use. Uh, although we haven't been able to find exactly what we want on the open source market, we've been able to find a lot of the bits and pieces. Uh, in fact, uh, Tanat, a summer student at CERN, 
uh, has developed a, a prototype of this, and this is his diagram of how data, how the query goes in and how it gets uh, managed and the pieces get put back together and sent back. Uh, how uh, incorporating ZooKeeper and MongoDB as, as parts of this so that all of the code that we write is stateless because state is hard and all of the state in the system exists in the third party tools, ZooKeeper and MongoDB. Uh, and also there's a poster on this. Uh, go see uh, Igor Mandrashenko's poster where he's describing uh, another distributed system with the same concept. So then the query language that was all over my abstract, I'm just going to put up this slide saying there are, there are cool things we can do with that. We can improve things even beyond just having uh, Python-based queries if we have a special language to, uh, which can be more highly optimized than, than procedural Python. Uh, but all of these things, uh, I think we can say that they're 2.0 features. Uh, we'll, our first goal is going to be making a query system where the queries are Python, and then beyond that, uh, we can make improvements. So, conclusions. Uh, AOD to plot is possible. Uh, this is a, a, a point that I've been uh, uh, trying to make with uh, uh, initial studies and benchmark studies, like the illustration slide I had before, uh, that there are, there's a few orders of magnitude of low-hanging fruit if you decided that your jobs are going to be super simple, like a query. Uh, well, now uh, we have an actual execution engine that is doing things uh, at these rates, these tens of megahertz rates. Um, so Python-based queries can be computed at single-threaded rates of ten, tens of megahertz. Um, and it uses this idea of translating code the way that SQL is done rather than deserializing data the way that uh, we do in root. Uh, and um, columnar data granularity has other useful uh, consequences, which I didn't talk about here, but see Igor's slide, uh, poster. And uh, we are prototyping some distributed architectures, uh, relying on third-party components wherever possible. So, but thank you. Um, Do I hand out the microphone? No, it's okay. okay. That will be a feature of root uh, 6.12 if our pull request, this is actually Brian's work. Um, and I added on, on top of that a Python interface. I could repeat. <laughs> our, our, our goal is to have it in 6.12, but it might live in the root experimental uh, namespace, which would mean that we those are the right to break them. Yeah, the DSL was this um, was this dumpster code. And actually, that's a development uh, since then. That um, uh, yes, this would this has some nice nicer features than using Python directly. Uh, but I have concluded I was spending all of my time on the fast execution part and thinking this is independent of language. Yeah. In fact, it's independent of language. You could use that in C sharp. Yeah. Other questions? So where would the simplicity stop? Because I can plot the PT of all my jets, but would I be able to do combinatorics in my query, like say combine pions and kaons to form these and do a vertex fit? Yes. Yes, that is the goal of this. Is because I know that how uh, the level of complexity that an analysis function reaches—it's not super complex like uh, like reconstructing tracks, but it's 
considerably more complex than SQL. And yes, you need to be able to do uh, uh, deeply nested loops with uh, with complex combinatorics. Yes. In fact, this uh, the system that that we have here uh, allows for uh, random access. So. Uh, Yes, the, the event data is re is, can be represented this way uh, with the code transformation, but also non-event data. Like you could have a stream of events and also a boosted decision tree, both expressed uh, as this columnar data with the code transformation that quickly accesses it. The boosted decision tree is being accessed non-sequentially uh, non and the events are being accessed sequentially. Yeah, while you're bringing the microphone, uh, for sake of example, these these were my test functions, and I did them deliberately to have common, you know, some combinatorics in it. Yeah. So playing a little bit the devil advocate here, uh, so this is meant to replace a bunch of the infrastructure that we have that uh, shaves an AOD to a DAOD to a mini AOD to a micro AOD to whatever, right? And be able to make float. Uh, I'm using the word AOD in a generic sense yeah. as mm -hmm. anything that comes out of the collaboration pub as, as shared collaboration. So a it could C++ be a micro AOD uh, or whatever. An event yeah. data model that is spit out of out of the reconstruction or yeah. some uh, collaboration wide analysis data object. So that's to be able to replace all of that or a bunch of this infrastructure. But to be able to do that, we need also an infrastructure to, to run all of this uh, uh, very clever, uh, interesting uh, work and software. But do did you make a little back of uh, the envelope calculation of whether it was more cost efficient than? Well, the the infrastructure that we're replacing here is not actually the the, the part that the experiments are centrally doing now. It's the parts that are decentralized uh, that the individual analyzers are doing now. So um, so these. Uh, frameworks that the that like one or two universities are developing, these are the pieces that we get replaced. So it's more on the tier two, tier three level. Yeah, okay. yeah, right. Because the stuff that currently doesn't have a um, uh, an official, it's it actually it's just the unofficial stuff, and we're replacing that with some official thing. 